Well, I can't tell you how honored I am to be here with you all tonight. Um, I'm going to share with you uh, some findings from AAUW's report, Why So Few uh, Women in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics, sometimes called the STEM fields, um, as well as some thoughts on why so few women are in positions of leadership in any field, um, and what can be done to increase women's representation in science and in leadership. For those of you who don't know, AAUW is the American Association of University Women, and it's uh, an organization founded in 1881 dedicated to gender equity. It's um, a membership organization, advocacy, um, research, and grant making or organization. And um, I, I want to thank the National Science Foundation for their grant to conduct the study, as well as um, contributions from AAW members. So I'm going to start briefly with just a description of where girls and women are in STEM subjects and fields. As you all know, women have made tremendous progress in education and the workplace over the past few decades, and um, including in science and engineering. High school preparation in math and science is a precursor to pursuing a science or engineering career later in life. Historically, boys have outperformed girls in math and science, but the gender gap has narrowed over time. And today, girls are doing as well as boys in math and, and science by most measures. You can see the chart um, on the left shows high school credits earned in math and science by gender between 1990 and 2009. And girls are shown in green and boys are in purple. And um, so you can see that in 2009, girls and boys earned on average the same um, number of credits in math and science, that's 7.4 credits. Um, and then on the right, you can see the grade point average in high school math by gender. And um, then again, girls are in green and boys are in purple. And you can see that girls' GPAs in math are actually higher than boys on average. And that's true in science as well. And, and the other um, encouraging thing about both of these charts is that you see that for girls and boys, um, they're actually taking more and more math and science credits and getting higher grades in them over time. So the result is that nearly equal numbers of girls and boys graduate from high school well prepared to pursue a career in science or engineering. Um, in college, however, far fewer women decide to major in a STEM field, um, particularly physics, computer science, and engineering, than boys do. So this chart um, shows the representation of women earning bachelor's degrees in various STEM fields. The biological and agricultural sciences are on the left, and so it shows the representation from 1966 through 2008. Um, so in 2008, women earned the majority of bachelor's degrees in the biological and agricultural sciences, and, and half in chemistry as well, and almost half in math. Um, um, but when you look over on the right, you see that um, those are the areas where women are still not as well represented. Just about a fifth of degrees in physics, engineering, and computer science went to women in 2008. And, and in computer science, you can see actually that women's representation is declining. Looking at the workforce, this chart shows the percentage of women in selected STEM occupations between 1960 and 2009. The top line is biological scientists, then chemists in purple, mathematical and computer scientists in green, physicists and astronomers in orange, and engineers in red. So in 1960, women made up 28% of working biologists, and, and actually less than 1% of working engineers. Um, in 2009, women made up 45% of working biologists and 14% of working engineers. So these are big increases. Um, looking at engineering, for example, from less than 1% to 14% is a huge increase. And yet 14% is still clearly a small minority. In entomology, um, specifically, according to the National Science Foundation, 47% of graduate students in entomology and parasitology were women in 2008. In the ESA, this year, however, um, women make up just 26% of the non-student members for which e the ESA has data. So this is actually more similar to women's representation in the physical sciences and engineering than in other biological sciences if the ESA is representative of the field of working entomologists. Um, however, um, among student members, women make up a full 50% of the membership for which the ESA has data. So entomology appears to be a changing field with women's representation increasing if after graduation, um, the women who are studying um, entomology today stay in the field. 
The purpose of the research report I'm going to talk about tonight is to present recent research findings that help explain why so few girls aspire to certain science and engineering fields and why relatively few women pursue and stay in these careers. The findings were chosen specifically because they have potential to change the way that people understand this problem. They're well-respected, peer-reviewed recent findings, and they have practical applications. Also, while the report is focused on girls and women, it has special meaning also for underrepresented minorities. And it's, these findings are actually important for anyone who's in science and engineering to know about. The report is based on um, a, um, an extensive literature review of the academic literature on gender and science, and then also interviews with top researchers. Why So Few presents research findings on the nurture side of the nature-nurture debate. Each finding demonstrates that social and environmental factors clearly contribute to the underrepresentation of women in science and engineering. So today, I'm going to share with you four of the findings that I think are especially interesting and relevant. And then I'll talk a bit about why so few women are found in any areas of leadership, including entomology. Now I'm going to steal Dell's water and take a drink. So the first two findings I'll talk about can help us understand why girls are less likely than boys to aspire to a career in science and engineering. The first comes from the research of Dr. Carol Dweck, who's a psychologist at Stanford University. And she looks at beliefs about intelligence. She finds that believing in the potential for intellectual growth in and of itself improves outcomes. Dr. Dweck's research provides evidence that a growth mindset, as opposed to a fixed mindset, benefits girls in math and science. The table shown here lays out the differences between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. Individuals with a fixed mindset believe that intelligence is static and inborn. In contrast, individuals with a growth mindset believe that intelligence can be developed through effort. Individuals with a fixed mindset are susceptible to a loss of confidence when they encounter challenges because they believe that if they're truly smart, things will come easily to them. And if they have to work hard at something, they tend to question their abilities and they're likely to give up. Individuals with a growth mindset, on the other hand, show a far greater belief in the power of effort. And in the face of difficulty, their confidence actually grows because they believe that they're learning and getting smarter as a result of challenging themselves. And in Dr. Dweck's research, she found that um, her population was divided pretty equally between fixed and growth mindset. These research findings are important for girls and women in science and engineering for two reasons. First, because encountering obstacles and challenging problems is really in the, is in the nature of scientific work. When girls and women believe they have a fixed amount of intelligence, they're likely to, to lose confidence and give up um, when they inevitably encounter difficulties in their coursework. And second, while a growth mindset benefits all students, it's particularly relevant for girls in math and science because negative stereotypes persist about girls' abilities in science and engineering. A growth mindset has been shown to protect girls from the harmful effects of stereotypes. There are a number of steps we can take to foster a growth mindset in children, and we make several recommendations in the report. The first is to teach children that intellectual skills can be acquired. So a fixed mindset can, be a, can become a growth mindset. And Dr. Dweck's research shows that when girls are taught that their intelligence can expand with experience and learning, they do better on math tests, and they're more likely to want to continue to study math in the future. And the second is to praise children for effort. So rather than saying, oh, you're so smart when children do something well, say, wow, you worked really hard at that, and, I, I really, and you did it. So rather than praising the outcome, you praise the effort. And this, this finding has gotten quite a bit of attention lately um, in a number of different uh, books and articles. Um, but Dr. Dweck's research show, suggests that we should praise children more for the accomplishments that they work hard for than for the victories that come easily to them. This encourages a growth mindset. And this is something I've been able to put into practice in, in my own life with my own kids. So um, it's not, it isn't something that comes, came naturally, but I have taught myself, rather than to praise my, my kids when they do something very quickly, to rather to praise them for things that take them longer to do. So it's, um, and, and not ever to say, you're smart, <laughs> but rather to say, I really like the effort that you put in. So I'm, oh. By the way, this finding about um, the growth mindset, it applies not only to children but to adults, including graduate students as well. So um, people have approached me after giving this talk and, and asked, you know, I said, you know, that they noticed that even in, um, among graduate students, 
women in science and engineering graduate students, um, that they still don't tend to have the confidence that, or, or believe that they can actually learn what they need to know to become excellent in their field. And um, the same advice applies to them, really, to believe in the power of effort and that learn to, to believe that learning actually changes the brain and that they um, that intellectual skills can be acquired. So, for anyone who's really interested in this topic, Carol Dweck has a book out called Mindsets that um, provides a path to developing a growth mindset. If that's something that you you would find interesting. The second finding is about gender differences in self-assessment in math and science. And um, Dr. Shelley Carell, a sociologist at Stanford University, um, first became interested in differences, gender differences in self-assessment when she taught chemistry to high school students. And she found that no matter how well the girls in her, her chemistry classes did, she had trouble convincing them that they really had any scientific aptitude. In contrast, among the boys she taught, no matter how poorly they did, they continued to believe that they were very good at chemistry. <laughs> and so, um, when she went back to school and became a sociologist, she um, delved into this issue and she analyzed the data set of more than 16,000 high school students and found that in fact, among students with the same past math performance in terms of test scores and grades, boys assessed their math abilities higher than girls did. So then she decided to test this finding in an experimental setting. Here's an example from her experiment. So see if you can answer this question. Does this rectangle have more black or more white? Does anybody want to guess? Yes, equal. That's right. So the answer is that there's equal amounts of black and white. In Dr. Carell's experiment, she identified a fictitious ability to, de to detect correct proportions of black and white as contrast sensitivity ability. Half the participants were told that men had more contrast sensitivity ability on average than women. And half were told that there were no gender differences in contrast sensitivity ability. Participants were asked to answer 20 questions like this with equal amounts of black and white, and each were told that they'd gotten 12 out of 20 correct. Despite being told that they scored the same, however, among participants told that men were better at contrast sensitivity ability, women assessed their ability lower than men did. Among participants told that there's no gender difference in contrast sensitivity ability, gender differences in self-assessment were not found. And these results are shown here in this chart. Again, women are shown in green and men are shown in purple. So you can see there's a difference um, uh, between assessment when in the group told that men are better at this task. So in the same experiment, um, participants were asked, how high would you have to score to be convinced that you had high task ability at this made up task? These results are shown in this chart. Again, women are shown in green and men are shown in purple. In the group where participants were told that men are better at this task, women indicated that they would have to earn at least 89% to think that they had high ability in that area. On the other hand, men thought that a score of 79% would indicate high ability. So that's a difference of 10 percentage points. In the group where students were told there is no gender difference in performance on this task, men and women had a much more similar idea of what score would indicate high ability, right around 82, 83%. So if you think about this finding as it relates to math and science, fields in which men are considered to excel, it suggests that girls believe that they have to be better in math and science than boys believe they have to be in order to think of themselves as good in these fields. There are many elements to choosing a career, but researchers agree that believing that you can be successful in the field is, is a prerequisite for choosing that field. Girls' lower self-assessment of their math ability, even in the face of good grades and test scores, as we saw in the last chart, along with their higher standard for performance in what are considered to be masculine fields can help us understand why fewer girls than boys aspire to science and engineering careers. So we make a few recommendations in the report as to what can be done to reduce gender differences in self-assessment. <clears throat> the first is for educators to set clear performance standards. The same letter or number grade on an assignment or exam might signal something different to girls than it does to boys. Female students may need to be reminded that a B in a difficult course is a grade to be proud of. And um, part of what um, Shelley Carell talks about in terms of this recommendation has to do with um, low grades in, in college um, 
um, classes in science and engineering. So the uh, sort of the weed out culture where the average score is a 50% on a, on a test, this creates uncertainty in students, this type of culture. And um, what, she's, what she explains is that it creates uncertainty in all students, but it really creates, m it creates more uncertainty in students who already are questioning whether or not they belong in the field. And that includes women, generally, often women, and um, underrepresented minorities as well. So the more that educators can reduce this uncertainty about students' performance, the less students will rely on stereotypes to make sense of their performance. And then the second um, recommendation that I, I'll mention is to help girls um, recognize their career-relevant skills. So girls are less likely to see their high grades in, in high school math and science as an indication that they could become a successful entomologist, for example, or computer scientist, just because these aren't fields that they see a lot of women in. So what we can do is help them, you know, we can say to them, wow, you're doing really well in your math and science courses. Maybe you, you could, you know, you would be good at, um, you know, becoming a, an engineer or a scientist. Um, to, so that we can help them see their, their success in these courses for what it is, not just a requirement for going to college, but an indication that they might become um, successful in science or engineering. So beliefs about intelligence and gender differences in self-assessment can help us understand why fewer girls pursue STEM careers, but that doesn't tell us the whole story. Women scientists, engineers, and technologists are more likely to leave science and engineering fields than both their male peers and women in other occupations. The Center for Work-Life Policy at Harvard University found that women scientists, engineers, and technologists are fairly well represented on the lower rungs of corporate ladders, making up just over 40% of these workers. More than half, however, quit these jobs by mid-career. Um, so why do women leave STEM careers? This study, the Center for Work-Life Policy study, um, cited the following major factors influencing women's decision to leave. Isolation, unsupportive work environment, extreme work schedules, and unclear rules about advancement and success. The last two findings from Why So Few I'm going to talk to you about are, are about two types of bias that relate to issues of workplace environment and can help us to understand why, why women may be more likely to leave scientific careers than men. The first of these is research on implicit or unconscious bias. Research by Dr. Mazarin Banaji and her colleagues at Harvard University find that most people associate science and math fields with male. Since this gender science implicit association test was established in 1998, more than a half million people from around the world have taken the test, and more than 70% of test takers more readily associated male with science and female with arts than the reverse. Implicit bias is common even among individuals who consciously reject gender stereotypes. Um, about women in science. And I can give you an example of my own uh, implicit bias that I discovered while I was while working as an engineer. I um, would have to sometimes call vendors, technical vendors, for information about products that they had. And I remember being on the phone with a representative from a heater vendor, and I needed some technical information, and I, I needed it quickly. So I was feeling impatient. I needed this information, and I was talking to a woman on the other end of the phone, and I remember myself thinking, I w she is not going to be able to give me this information. I wish she would just send me to the guy who will be able to give me this information that I need. And so here I was, a woman engineer, assuming that this, another woman engineer was not competent. And undoubtedly, day after day, people were making the same judgment about me. So here I was, both judging people based on implicit bias and then being, being judged um, by, uh, by other people's implicit bias. So um, it's a good example of how bias is implicit or unconscious. So I didn't consciously believe that women were not as competent at engineering as men. I believed that I was a capable engineer. But I was still my unconscious mind held a belief that women were not as technically capable as men. <laughs> 